I don't think every, everything's ever going to go back to the way it is was, and that's not all bad. I think there's good things that we can come from it too. But I think with our kids' mental health, we need to look at how they're thinking, we need to look at how they're feeling, and we need to look at what they're doing. Those all contribute to the rise of depression, anxiety. I don't want you to shut down your kids' screens. They are their modes of connection, a lot of times to their peers. And they are also, distraction is a great way to self-regulate sometimes. If you're really anxious, games do, among us will distract you well. But at the same time, I think we also need to help them find other interests and things they can do that may be different now. Hey there, I'm Amy Connell. Welcome to Graced Health, the podcast for women who want simple and grace-filled ways to take care of themselves. And of course, we always love to enjoy a little chocolate in the process. I'm a certified personal trainer and nutrition coach who wants you to know your eating, movement, and body don't have to be perfect. You just need to be able to do what you're called to do. Today, I am bringing back a popular topic from this show. You may have heard my conversation back in season four on caring for our teens' mental health with Dr. Michelle Bankson. And if you haven't listened to it, I'll put the link in the show notes and I will let you in on a little secret. That topic was one of the most popular episodes we have had to date. I know I am constantly evaluating my kids, which probably drives them crazy. And I bet your mental health radar is elevated as well, because this last year has been, I mean, what what words do we even have to, to describe it? My guest today, Michelle Niedert, brings so much wisdom and truly applicable ways to foster our children's and honestly, our own mental health. We talk about how COVID has affected everything, how to dig into the answer of good or fine. When you ask how things are going, surely, surely there's another mama out there who has dealt with that. And the one thing Michelle would pack in every child's backpack so much more. I know you're going to get so much out of this conversation. Michelle is a licensed professional counsel counselor for 20 years, podcast co-host of Raising Brave Beauties, and the co-author of Loved and Cherished 100 Devotions for Girls. She provides practical solutions, real life examples, and joins her audiences in the parenting trenches by raising her own two school age children. Now, before we get to Michelle, I have a special free program for anyone who wants strong legs, but their knees won't let them do squats or lunges. Grab the free guide for 12 movements to strengthen seven muscles, a video showing how to do them, and three customizable workouts plus a bonus warm up. You can get it over at gracedhealth.com slash strong legs. Okay, let's bring on Michelle. Michelle, welcome to the Grace Health Podcast. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you so much for having me, Amy. I'm excited to be here. I'm really excited to have this conversation. But before we dig in, can you share a little bit about yourself and um, what you do and who you who you serve? Yeah, uh, I've been a mental health professional for over 20 years, and I've worked in a psychiatric facility. I've run a church counseling center. Um, worked in foster care with play therapy kids with attachment issues and trauma, and then worked, loved a job where I designed a school counseling crisis program and was their crisis counselor for a district that served about 20, over 20,000 kids. And now I own Community Counseling Associates, which is actually in the Dallas area. And we service all of Texas on telehealth. And we are a group of therapists to all specialize in adolescents. That's the one thing we all have in common. We all treat teens and their families. And then we have other niches, like some like the little kids and do play therapy, some do couples, some do addiction and things like that. And then in, I kind of laugh in my second life. No, I'm kidding. But I'm, <laughs> you do. <laughs> you, you live several lives. <laughs> I'm also the author of Loved and Cherished, which is a wonderful, beautifully covered, no credit to me whatsoever, just my publisher, devotional for tween girls. I'm also working on a book right now under a deadline for women on mindset. And then we will have another book for kids coming out next year with my co-author, Proverbs 31, author and speaker Lynn Cowell on 
managing your emotions. So I am a busy lady, definitely. But my passion is helping parents prevent and discuss mental health issues with their kids. Okay. Well, we are in the right space today because that's what I want to talk to you about. Awesome. I love um, it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Preventing and having mental health discussions. And it's funny that you talk about um, working in that kind of counseling crisis mode, because I feel like that's what we have been in, in one sense or another for a year. You know, we, March of 2020, like the world shuts down. And then we had all of these events that are traumatic, like you know, big T trauma, right? You know, all on their own. And as a parent, it's been really hard, to, or actually as a woman, it's been really hard to navigate. And then it's been really difficult to uh, parent through that. So now that we've been in this for about a year, I was, um, I was hoping that we, you could kind of help me and help my community navigate some of that. Well, I want to start by just telling your community, unfortunately, Amy, Mental health statistics are just growing in our country, sadly. COVID is affecting that, which you would expect, right? Because we're more isolated. We have more screen time. We have less physical activity. You're a health coach. You get that. Um, There is more anxiety. Just, I mean, there's not only anxiety in us. There's anxiety just out there kind of around. So unfortunately, that's what the, the, like, the um, Center for, like, Substance Abuse and Mental Health, their statistics are showing Like for adults, we're going from one in four to five to one in three adults struggling with some depressive symptoms of hopelessness. You can imagine where our kids are in all this. Yeah. You know, it's funny. One of the things I've had this conversation with a couple people recently is I feel like we are in this space where we're going to learn so much uh, over the next, I mean, decades, whether it's the education gap that we're experiencing right now, mental health, um, physical health with, you know, how COVID has impacted our body on the long term. But that, you know, the mental health is really, I mean, I have witnessed it in myself. I've witnessed it in friends. I have witnessed it on social media. I mean, I just the other day in a, in a group that I was in, this guy was like, you know, kind of listed off all of his challenge. And he was like, I'm just not sure there's a reason to go on. I mean, like heartbreaking, um, heartbreaking problems. And then if this is how adults are feeling, I just, I I can't figure out, I mean, I like, I don't even know how kids are even like a lot of them don't even have the tools to do that. Right. Because they may not be in therapy. They may not be seeking out. Like, I think it's fascinating, right? Like I, I think the therapy and the counseling, you know, I'm learning so much, you know, whereas my kids aren't necessarily doing that. Let's talk about that. So your kids, need some emotional vocabulary first. And that hopefully, like, since we're talking to parents of teens, a lot of your listeners are, we're hoping they've already developed some of that and that they understand that like sad, mad, scared exist on a spectrum from cautious to terrified, from uh, disappointed to devastated. And we want to help them with the perspective of those those, those timelines or those widths of scales, I call them scales, emotional scales. And then there's the emotional scale of like, you know, um, frustrated all the way to ready to blow my top kind of thing. And, and I do think that's where we start and we want to make sure kids have that vocabulary. And then we want to have some parenting check-ins with that, um, to see how they're feeling. So how do we begin to define this emotional vocabulary. I mean, it's not something, you know, adolescents, teens, I mean, it's not like you can sit down and go, okay, this is what this means. And this is, you know, how are you today? Let's do a check-in or or maybe that is what we do. Maybe I'm just, maybe I'm totally missing the mark on all of this, but how do we go about describing these words and and, and giving them the vocabulary to use? Okay. So first of all, and this is going to be, I'm going to say this over and over again in different ways, probably to you. We're going to model that as parents. So our kids catch our vocabulary. So the more we use variety of vocabulary, then they're going to absorb that, number one. Number two, you will be surprised how much, this is what I find at least in our offices when we're face-to-face with a kid. These kids read, these kids are on screens, even things, my son has a pretty high level of emotional vocabulary at 10. And the other day I asked him, where'd you learn that word? And he said, Minecraft. (laughs) 
<laughs> you know, like <laughs> even there, he's learning emotional vocabulary. There was another person who said, like, I'm really just something or another. And he went and looked it up because he was curious to what it meant. So you never know where your kids are being exposed to emotional vocabulary. So let, but here's the thing you want to do. Kids like to, especially if they don't like to talk a lot, you know, this won't be, it's easy to tell what somebody who is built like me, who's transparent and very verbal, what's going on with them. Mm -hmm. Unless I don't want you to know. We can talk about that in a minute. But then for a lot of kids like my son, who is less transparent, less easier to read, you do have to, and you have boys, right, Amy? Don't right. You? Yes. I do. So you have to, a lot of times, approach and ask them, and this is going to be the typical adolescent answer. Good Fine. Right. So I'm going to give you a really great question to ask your kids right off the top. What does good look like to you? Oh. What does fine look like? So that's a way to begin to ask them. And if they, if they do the shrug, I don't know. Then you can start with some choices for them. Are you fine like you haven't cried in a long time and you're really happy and hopeful about the future? Or are you fine like you're kind of in a daze just going through the motions? Or are you fine, like, I don't really want to tell you this, but when I shut the door to my room, I think I'm starting to think really awful thoughts about myself and my world, and I'm really sad. And sometimes I even wonder if it would be easier to just not be here. Like, you know, and, and sometimes they'll look at you like, Mom, of course not. But sometimes if it is your kid, they may go, I, I don't want you to worry about me, but some of that is starting to happen to me. This is what I'm finding with the pandemic I've never seen before as a mental health professional. Okay. I've got faith-based kids, believe in Jesus, read their Bibles, because I'm the mental health consultant for a Christian school as well in this area. And they have no history of mental health. They haven't seen a counselor before. They don't have any signs of depression or anxiety. And within three months, they're thinking about, they're thinking thoughts they don't even know where they're coming from. Let me tell you how a lot of them get there, Amy. They are losing sleep. And that's where mm -hmm. I'm trying to get parents to also ask questions during this time. Like, I will tell you this. I'm a counselor. I know my kids pretty well, I feel like. I remember in the month of May 2020, I asked my daughter, when's the last time you cried? And she's like, Mom, I cry every night before I go to bed. I hate the oh. world. I don't like being on a screen. I don't like not seeing my friends. This this is not a place I can live very easily because she's wired a lot like me. So we yeah. worked immediately on making some changes to creating some COVID circles for her, seeing kids in parking lots. She needed that. And I'm so grateful. Her school has chosen to offer with a lot of safety pro protocols in place in-person school. We have chosen mm -hmm. in-person school for her. The son is wired very differently. He's living his best life in online school. <laughs> no lie. I have one on each dad. <laughs> <laughs> You couldn't make the world any better for him than it is right now. And that's why you just have to ask. And you do need to trust that your kids are telling you the truth. But then you need to verify. One question I am asking is, how much are you sleeping? When did you go to bed last night? Did you because, and that night? really has that much of an impact on our mental health. Yes. Yes. Okay. Look it up. Sleep is huge for sleep is huge for brain functioning. So you start to go two to three nights without sleep, which ha can happen in a manic episode where somebody can get, and that can happen to somebody who doesn't have any history of bipolar. They just get so anxious. We've got research studies uh, in the biblical doctorate program I worked on of seminary students pulling all nighters several nights in a row, having almost like, um, delusional schizophrenic behavior due to la like in an airport getting arrested almost in a treatment center. And then the doctor worked with him and realized this person is going to be fine once they get sleep and they don't ever need to go three days without sleep again. A lot of us, wow. just, I mean, that is how you break somebody down is you deprive them of sleep. So we need to make sure our kids are sleeping for sure. And, and I will tell you that I would say over half of the cases of adolescent anxiety, depression, thoughts of self-harm, um, ADHD getting worse, any of that, when we look into their sleep, they're not sleeping like they need to be. And and you can look up your kids' sleep chart realms. Um, for their, You should know that as a parent. I would encourage you to look that up. Now, yes, it, I got a 13-year-old. I can't make her go to sleep. But mm -hmm. I can encourage some environments that help her go to sleep. For example, her 
she is allowed to have her phone in her room because she uses an alarm and she listens to Spotify worship. But every other feature on her phone besides calling 911 and texting me shuts off at 10 o'clock at night, 1030 at night. Now she's kind of renegotiated a little some nights. <laughs> but um, and, and that's where I think it's so important that we make sure that our kids are getting good rest. And that I'll be honest with you, that's hard for me as a 50 year old because I'd like to go to bed before them. <laughs> I'm just going to be honest. Michelle, you are speaking straight to me because I, I mean, I go to bed on my wonderful night. I go to bed at nine. I mean, it's really yeah. closer to like nine or nine thirty. And uh, yeah, I mean, I can't, honestly, it's been years since my kids went to bed when I did or later. <laughs> and do you know why that is? If you don't know this, you can look up the research on this melatonin, which is the sleep hormone. Um, begins um, to spike in adolescent bodies in the early morning. So therefore they like to stay up late and sleep late because of those melatonin spikes at that time. Well, I knew that there were some hormonal um, reasons for that staying up late and sleeping late. And it's funny because depending on what people's, what the kids schools look like, you know, so I have one online, one face to face and the online one, when he doesn't have athletic practice in the morning, he doesn't have to be like sitting down until nine o'clock. And so this has been great for him and for his sleeping. And I do want to say just for the record, sleep is highly important to me. And I will, I mean, everybody knows, everybody who knows me knows I'm really protective of it. But I guess I didn't realize that connection with mental health, which totally makes sense. But I'm not if, if <laughs> start having a lot of depression and anxiety. One of the first things that's going to get interrupted in their in their physical symptomology is sleep. Okay. Okay. Well, that's interesting. I'm curious if you are seeing an uptick in particular mental health challenges with, um, with the teens that you work with. I mean, is, you know, depression, anxiety, ADHD, um, you know, anything like that? I mean, like, has this last year hit one area of mental health harder than another? No, because here's what I see. These are all symptoms of something not working right in our brain and our body. And I do want to be careful with this with teenagers, especially I I'm working with a teenager right now who started believing that her diagnosis is her destiny. And I don't think that's the case. There's snapshots of periods of time where we're struggling. And the research says, just to give you an idea of where this is, it depends on which article you read. One in four to one in five kids will have a mental health diagnosis by the time they turn 18. I think COVID's going to up that to two. Two and four or two and five. I think definitely two and five. Uh, So it's going to, or one and three, it's going to increase that number because here's some other factors we need to think about. When we look at mental health and all the dynamics to go, that go into making a person mentally healthy, one is the physical aspect of sleep and movement. Kids are moving less than they used to be. That's definitely for sure. Something else that we look at is socialization. Are they happy with their relationships? Do they have healthy relationships? Depend, and, and here's where I'm going to talk to a conservative group of parents that's like, well, my child would never have a phone, da, 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 da. Well, right now, then, if you don't have a home phone in your home, how does your child socially communicate right now is a question I'm asking parents. And how are you providing opportunity for that? Even if it's from a distance, how are you creating an opportunity for that? Because we were created to be connected. Yeah. And when we deprive humans of healthy growth and connection. And it's hard to make new friends. You have a friendship shift. I'm writing an article right now for Focus on the Family on the friendships of girls. You have a friendship shift in the middle of COVID. It can be pretty tough to reestablish new relationships. And so we as parents just need to be aware of these things. We're no longer like really like somebody like me who's a pretty proactive parent. I planned play dates for my kids when they were little. I wanted them to learn socialization. We need to be making sure our kids, my son laughed because, you know, he's the introvert of the family. He's like, I had my one play date this week. That was like a rule of mine when he was little. You had to have one play date a week. But our kids, you need to make sure your kids are having quality interactions a couple of times a week with a couple of people. You can be one of them. But let me tell you what, every family comes with its own set of dysfunctions. You want your kids to have relationships outside of your family because they learn and grow from the strengths and weaknesses of others. And that's an important component of this. So we've got this physical piece. We've got this mental piece. We've also got kids with more downtime because they're not in as many activities as they were. We're not going as many places, doing as many things, 
at even just driving to go eat versus like eating dinner. Family dinner at my home takes so much less time than family dinner at a restaurant where we've driven, we've sat down, we've had a meal. So with that, they've got more downtime. And unfortunately, the enemy is mean. He likes to steal, kill, destroy, jack with your thinking. Kids can hear parents say five things to them, one being corrective, and they will hear they're an awful person. So because of that, some of them have too much time to get in their heads and overthink and go into these negative spirals and, you know, well, if I can't do this, I might as well be really perfectionistic at this. You know, I can't do this activity right now. So I'm going to put all my efforts into my grades. And that comes from where are our kids getting their sense of worth from? That's a really great point. Okay. Um, talk to me a little bit about the line between being vulnerable as a parent and saying these things are bothering me and kind of using that language, right? Modeling the right language and modeling, opening your heart to maybe saying too much about what's going on. So, you know, it might be that something in in the world will just (laughs) pick, choose whichever one it is, right? Uh, Really bothers you. And you know, going off and, and, and talking about that. So I think that it's important that we, or I actually, I'm, I'm looking to you to either to comment on this, but I feel like it's important to be, to use those words, but where's that line? Where's that line of like, this is too much. And this is not a healthy way of modeling dialogue to our children. Okay. So first of all, I would ask, have you processed it with someone else so that the intensity is down a notch? We don't want to use our kids as our therapist. That's not a healthy thing that we want to do. So we don't want to look to them to support and fix us. But we want to share with them when we've worked through something, all the feelings we felt, and then how we got through them. And then we want to end on that end of hope side. So if we're not there, if we are still, like I'm reading this book right now, The 15 Conscious Habits of a Leader, and it's so good. And he talks about this idea that we have in psychology that's so important, and it's called that you have to feel your emotions long enough. And if you don't, you will loop your emotions and they'll keep coming and coming and coming and you won't get out of that loop. I don't think you want to feel all your emotions in front of your kids all the time. Now, this depends a lot on their age, their own maturity and sense of wisdom. My sister got some bad news yesterday and her daughter, like she was talking to her daughter about how sad she was about it. And she'd already talked to me. She'd already talked to a couple other people, but she was just sharing with her. She's a little sad today and she wanted her to be aware of that. And her daughter started in on the parental, usually, you know, drum of, well, God's going to take care of this and we just need to trust him. And, and I love what my sister said back to her. She said, you know, I think I just need to be sad for a little while. And I mean, and her daughter gets that because she's a teenager. She's like, yeah, mom, be sad. Don't close, close that loop. Don't start that loop going, you know, go ahead and work through that sadness. So I want to give parents permission to not let their kids get stuck in their emotions, but to feel their emotions. But when we talk to them ourselves about how we're feeling, I think we need to be closer to the side of some resolution than in the middle of ultimate chaos. So on an intensity scale, I'll just throw this out here just off the top of my head. Of one to 10, I don't think you want to be in the seven to 10 range when you're talking to your kids, if you're scared, sad, or mad, because that's a lot of emotion. The other thing I think you need to have a clear message already sent to your kids is I'm not fragile because that is one thing kids struggle with when they have a fragile parent, they feel the need to care for them instead of have their parents take care of them. So I'm not fragile. There is nothing you and I are ever going to face that God can't get us through. Like they need to have already established that you have that confidence. And I tell my kids, there is nothing you're going to bring to me that is going to like devastate me, disappoint me, make me not love you. But you don't need to be worried about me being worried about you. That is my job to parent you and to care for you. And that it is not your job to prevent me from being a parent. Oh, Protect that's great. me from that, right? So, yeah. and the way we show, and let me say, it's going to come back. You're going to hear this over and over again, Amy. It comes back to so many parents I know are so worried about their kids' mental health. And I'm like, first thing I ask them when they come in the office and they want to talk about that on a parent consult, how's your mental health? How are you doing? You know, are you, are you on medication? Are you taking it? Are you doing the things we're talking about here? Are you moving? Are you eating well? Are you sleeping well? 
Are you thinking positive thoughts about your day? Are you letting your mind control you or are you controlling your mind? Because that's what we taught the girls in our online loved and cherished camp is like every morning, feet on the floor. You don't think, how do I feel today? You think, how do I want to feel? And then what Bible verse or truth can I say to myself that's going to produce that feeling? So do you want to do it with me? I love it when people want to do it with me. Oh, you're putting me on the spot. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Yay. Because I think this helps moms get it, you know, okay. like because they need to, people need to see what it looks like a lot of times. So okay. and how would you like to feel for the rest of your day? I would like to feel accomplished and confident in what I have done. Okay. Accomplished and confident in what you would done, what you've done. So what would, give me a thought you could think that would make you feel that way just in general. Well, accomplished. I'm a rule, I'm a rule follower and a to-do checker. So getting off the big project that I have, um, that is like on my list of to do today, getting that done. Okay. So, and is it, is it manageable? Is that a smart goal? Is that a realistic goal? Is this project one that could be done today? Yes. Okay. Yeah. It's been something I've been working for. Or okay. Working cool. on. So yeah. This is a frog you've been eating at slowly by slowly chomping it like a big elephant piece by piece. And you're almost there. Exactly. Okay. So yeah. And I can, I don't mind sharing it, but you know, I've been working on this manuscript and so yeah. today is the day I want to finish up the manuscript, get it transferred over to the preferred uh, format for my editor and email it to her. Okay. So that's a really scary, that's also, I mean, like accomplished and confident, that's what I'm needing. Cause that's a really scary thing to do to hit send. Okay. So let's talk about what you could think, cause this could apply to anything and we need to help our kids think through this. So okay. you could think, and I like to add these three little words in front of all my phrases with my clients, with God's help, who are faith-based. So with God's help, if you said to yourself, I am confident this can get done, how does that feel? Like a relief. Like a relief, right? So then you yeah. say that, so then you're going to repeat that in the morning. You might repeat that anytime you go near your computer, you pick like a way to do it. Brendan Burchard, who's a great secular um high performance coach kind of guy talks about going through doorways and using doorways as the trigger in your home to have you say whatever you're saying to yourself. So you can kind of trickle it through your day. Um, so something like that. And then, um, if you would do that, I think you'll find that. So with my, with a kid, they might be saying something like, I want to feel confident in my schoolwork today. So their phrase may be like, I am well prepared and I have done the best I could. No matter the results. Okay. Like that's something I have kids work on sometimes who are perfectionist. I have I have I'm well prepared. I've done the best I could, no matter the results. And and then I want them to learn to accept that and feel that. And then that kind of helps them relax a little bit. Yes. Yes. So we really gotta we want to take it into that level. Like, what are you thinking? And, and I want parents to grab that skill and then they can help their kids grab that skill because our thoughts do control our emotions so much. You can have the same thing happen in our country and you can go off the deep end emotionally or you can then reel it and you're going to feel those feelings at first. Like, like I said, we don't want to loop. So we're going to feel the feelings. But then after those feelings have kind of fleshed through our body then we want to look at, okay, what could I think, you know, and that's where I think our faith comes in. Cause if we truly believe I'm reading a book right now about your enemy, that God works everything for good. It's kind of, it was interesting. Somebody sent it to me as they listened to a story I'd shared about suffering in, in church work actually. And that those enemies sometimes move us where we're meant to be. Oh, and that's, no, that's the kind of hope and strategy we want our kids to have. I do think about that. Think about Paul and Barnabas. They had this big disagreement, but those two ministries went exponential because they separated. Mm -hmm. Even though it looked mm -hmm. like a horrible conflict over, I think it was over Timothy, it ended up being this great thing that expanded the kingdom further. Um, John Townsend and Henry Cloud have a book called Necessary Endings, and that's kind of the same concept of this. And so okay. it's the idea. And so I think that's something else we've got to help our kids with. Things are changing. And if right. there was one, like people ask me back to school time, what's the one thing you'd pack in your kid's backpack if you could? And I said, flexibility. Oh, that's yeah. the mental health yeah. tool I would give them. 
Because if we have the ability to be flexible, then we can adapt to our scenarios. It's a very important skill that we look at when we look at like even marital success is how flexible are you and how connected are you? That's really good. That's great. Okay. I want to take a little bit of a turn. Yep. Um, so one of the part, one of the things that we have seen um, over the last year is kind of a polarization of ideals, um, values, you know, politics. I mean, we don't need to go into any of that. We're like, we all know this, right? And I think because our children are at home and they're on the screens and they're and I, you know, I got to give some of the platforms, a decent amount of credit, like they're putting out news, they're putting out, you know, we talk a lot with my kids about like finding balanced sources and non-bias and all of that kind of stuff. I have a friend who's a journalist, so she's really coached me a lot on that. I love that. um, We learned that in school. I don't know if you learned that. and And I did ask my daughter and she said they had something on propaganda, which is how advertisers are successful and how they kind of try to hit our buttons and stuff like that. Yeah. So I think our kids do need some education in that area. Definitely. Yeah, they absolutely do. And then of course, the, all of the algorithms that go with it, the, um, the social dilemma was really eye opening oh, and yeah. terrifying at the same time. But okay. with that, with that, and just in general, as our kids are getting older, I mean, you know, starting from probably, I, I think probably around in middle school, they're starting to develop their own opinions about things. Yes. This is good. This is healthy. This is normal. I, I, I recognize this, but I'm wondering what happens as parents, how do we help, how do we respect where they are when they are coming to conclusions that we feel are maybe not, um, biblical? You want to go all the way there or no? Well, we can, I mean, we can go, I don't want to say right. That's not the word that I want to use. Right. But it's the, um, you know, things that we just don't agree with. We're like, I don't, I don't know that I really think that. So, so help us, help us with that. Because I think that there's, there's probably a lot of that out there. All right. So first of all, I want to tell you about narcissism, this kind of weird thing to bring up. I don't know if I've ever talked about this in a podcast, but true narcissism as a parent is when you think your child is an extension and reflection of yourself. They're not. Oh, right. So that's the first thing you got to let go of is your child was given their own free will by God. And they are going to be allowed, especially as they enter ages of accountability, which in biblical times was like 12 or 13 then they're going to begin to make their own decisions about what they think and what they believe. And to a large degree, your parent education days aren't near the same as they were before. Like their their willingness to absorb from you is going to be less. But here's the thing. Your kids see how you live. They know what you've taught them. In fact, here's what happens in my office a lot when we get into one of these really sticky subjects, sometimes on like sexuality, gender, politics, whatever it is. And I asked that kid, what does your parent believe? That kid can tell me everything that parent was going to say. So I I do that to assure the parent, you've done your job. You've done the parenting job, check. Because your kids aren't your parenting report card. The way they turn out is not how you, how you raise them is how you raise them. How you control your anger, how you teach them, how you model. Those things are how you parent it. How your kids turned out is between them and God and their will and their choices to a large degree. Do you have influence over that? Absolutely. But that's where you look at yourself in the mirror. You're not looking at them to fix them. So it's really important that we become a culture that learns. And I think we used to be one and I don't know what's going on now, but we are struggling with agreeing to disagree well. Yes, we totally are. are. That. And the first one is, is something I don't think a lot of people are talking about. And the first skill is emotional self-regulation. Those are big words. That means I have to control my own feelings yeah. and have them in a healthy zone, which is under that, on that one to 10 scale, under a seven, before I get into a conversation with someone who might disagree with me, if that really bothers me. And that's how you're made. Just to give you an idea, some of us are made where that we struggle with that more because we're J's. On a Myers-Briggs oh, test like that. <laughs> versus P's, which are perceivers. So some people see things as very black and white, and, and I'm not one of those. I see a lot of gray. I see a yeah. lot of shades. And so I don't really struggle that much with having somebody in front of me who disagrees. I hate the wrongs of this world, but I know this is earth, the antithesis of heaven, which means it's going to be broken. If everything right. worked right, we wouldn't be here anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no, it would be heaven. It'd be heaven on earth. So if there is no heaven on earth, 
So, and I deal with this so much when it comes to the problem of pain, the problem of suffering, the problem of death, loss of a child, cancer, everything in my offices. God allowed, he is ultimately in control of the eternity, but he is allowed on this earthly world for things to be broken and not work right. And so with that, our kids are going to experience that. And I think here's the other thing though, there are things that we've been arguing about like it theologically for like decades, not decades, centuries, because I've been to seminary and we're going to have to learn to respect people who don't think like us. I agree. So I'm a, I'm a mental processor, mm-hmm. which makes it really hard to interview people sometimes because I just kind of want to sit in it for a while, but that's, <laughs> that's hard to the conversation. Oh, no, I'd like to <laughs> several of these things we're talking about. These are big things. <laughs> yeah. But, um, I do think that have, and this is something that I've evolved in because I think I used to be in college at one of the, the J, right? The judging. And I think I've, I've definitely evolved into more of the P, but hearing conversations or hearing people's perspective, um, and respecting him, even though I'm not, I may not agree with him, helps me to think about it in a different situation, which again has been so hard, I think, uh, with being quarantined because we're not, we're not stopping and talking to people in the grocery store. We're not meaning at the water cooler. We're, you know, our kids aren't, I mean, there's, they can't even talk, you know, during passing period at school. And so it's just, it's really hard to hear other perspectives right now, unless you're intentional about doing it. But let's talk about it when our kids differ from ours. So okay. I think th- that was your head, up, like the heart, I think of your question. And, and that is where you say less and you pray more is something I tell parents, okay. especially when you know, they know what you think and what you believe to be truth. And then the other thing is that you care more about them being attached to God than you care about being right about certain things. Oh, that's good. Okay. Because that, that's why we wrote Loved and Cherish, because that attachment to God, then God is big enough to work through those things if they're really off in their, your child's life. And, and a lot of times, guess what? It's part of their testimony. It's part of their story. It's part of their um, Joseph experience that God is going to work for good in their lives. And you're going to have, it's hard. Oh, let me tell you, I was talking to a mom today and she said, it is so hard to watch my kids suffer. We're sitting in this pep rally and not be able to fix it. And I'm like, and you know, I mean, she's talking to me because I'm a professional counselor. We can't fix it either. Right. You know, all we can do is offer tools and and hope that when God, when the time is right, God will use those tools in these kids' lives to, to create what he is meant for them to be and to create and to fulfill the purposes he has for them in the kingdom. And it may be the story of when I was a teenager, I believed this. Mm-hmm. And then these things happen and I came to this. So I don't want to interrupt. God, I mean, I went through this myself. I can't believe I'm talking about this. Um, so this fall, I went through this. My daughter went through this time where she just kind of pulled away from God, changed her friend circle, and I got worried. Yeah. I got really concerned. All of a sudden, we were those parents. And I've got quotation marks. Y'all can't see them. But we were those parents, you know, with the dumb rules and all. And we've never heard this talk out of this child. And, and, and you know what I did? I, we said a little bit like, you know, you're going to be respectful. Um, we are going to set limits, get over it. You know, the hard things, you know, we care more about your, your being who you're going to be than how you feel about us, which is the suckiest parenting part of the job, if you ask me. But then I went on to, to do what I feel like made the biggest difference. I, not in a gossipy way and in a way that I felt like protected her. My, I reached out to these moms. These are my moms. They have been with me, us since in community since we were in kindergarten. And I said, please pray for my daughter. Something's going on. I'm launching a book. I feel like that might have something to do with it. I think she's <laughs> under some spiritual attack, but this is not her. And something is going on. And they started praying. And you don't know. She asked me to go to a revival. I didn't even want to take her to. It was at a church that we're not connected with. And I, I knew they weren't following a lot of the guidelines in Texas regarding the, what we're supposed to be doing with COVID, that they were just trusting God. And I believe you trust God and follow the rules. Difference of opinion there. And, um, but I let her go. And that revival convicted her. God, the spirit of God fell upon her in that revival, that three-day youth revival. 
convicted her that she was, she had fallen away from him, that he still loved her and got her back on track. And let me tell you what, that girl is more on fire and passionate and cooperative with us in her own sassy way than I um, could have ever imagined. And that's where we have to not try to control. I mean, I could have said, now I was wise. I feel like I didn't say you can't see those people, but I did say, you can't see those people under their parents' roof because I don't know their parents. You can, they can come here because there were new people entering her life. And I felt like there was some influence there. And that's the thing I'm going to talk to parents about. During COVID, we're seeing, because you can't act, like somebody's parents aren't letting you access them. So now we're getting new sets of parents. And those shifts, you know, kids are vulnerable when schools shift and merge and change. And then they're vulnerable in situations like this. And you need to watch their relationships online. I don't know how emphatically I can say that to you. They can develop a very innocent relationship with someone online while they're gaming who has completely different values, who slowly will whittle away and have a stronger voice than you do. Yeah. And so we want to be cautious. So I asked my kids, what are you talking about with your friends? Tell me a little bit about that. What's going on in everybody's life? Not, and you know, my daughter's kind of like, you're nosy. I'm like, I am nosy. I'm a counselor. I'm going to be nosy with you. I don't need to know all the business, but I just need to, I just, and I said to her, but here's what I did say to her too. If I go talking to everybody else that I'm nosy and a gossip, but if you tell me things and I pray about them, hopefully I can help have your back and their back. I can be for these kids the way God is for them. And that hit home with her. She said, well, if that's the case, pray, pray. I'm not going to tell you their name, but pray for one of my friends. They're really struggling right now. And I'm like, Doug. That's great. And the other thing that I want to go back to that you were just talking about is as a parent, when you were kind of struggling with your own thing and going to the friends, I I have considered, um, I've actually considered writing like an anonymous (laughs) post to, to, you know, scary mommy or something like that about how, um, how isolating and how lonely parenting teenagers can be sometimes Mm. because we're in this phase, you know, when my kids were little, if something happened, I could go to my friends talk about it with them and not feel like I was violating their privacy or their individuality. And it's, it's very hard to know when they're in that, you know, higher teenager way or um, age of like, where's that line? And so, you know, I have a very, very, you know, small group of friends that are actually, they're not like part of a group. It's just, you know, one here and one here and one here that I can go to and be honest with, but it's a lonely feeling sometimes when you have those, challenges and you don't want to, you don't want to violate your kid. Yeah. And and let me tell you what, some communities aren't safe to do that. There we're in a very healthy faith-based school community, but there are some where if your child's mess it up, everybody else's kid is going to be told not to be around them and they're going to get more isolated and only have the option of the negative choice, you know, that kind of thing. And instead I asked that they would swallow them up, swallow her up and embrace her back in which is what she was in a group of friends. And those mamas were like, let's do it. Let's get them together. Let's figure this out. You know, and I would do that for them in a heartbeat. So I I think it's important that you are developing relationships with your child's friends, even though we're incredibly busy. And in an ideal world, those people are going to have similar values to you. And that starts young, like helping that kind of happen. And, And that's something I pray for. I ask God for um, and we have fit families that have different values and cultures than us in our world too. And we, we learn from them and we enjoy them, but they're not like, I, I'm writing this article right now. It's funny. I have all this on my head I'm talking about friendship circles and there's like the intimacy circle. And then there's the hangout circle. And then there's the, you know, the next level circle. And you've got in that intimacy circle, there should be shared value and faith. The next circle. Yeah, it's great because then we can have impact for the kingdom. Yeah. And I think that's something that I have naturally learned as I've gotten older. And it's um, probably not something that our our kids realize as much. One of my kids, he was like, Mom, I don't have as many friends as I used to. And I we kind of talked through that. And I said, No, actually, you do just your your circle has gotten smaller, because you're not it's those outer people who he enjoys, and he likes hanging out with, but they're not his core group. And I was like, your core group hasn't changed. He's like, No, so that, that was a good conversation to have to help him realize that 
Okay. You know, not everybody gets the same value. You look like you've. You're- uh, yeah, because I want to tell you what you did in that. You broke a lie of the enemy there that I'm more alone. Nobody likes me. Maybe there's mm-hmm. something wrong with me. You know, they're trying to figure out who they are. So helping him change his perspective there through your questions and through your pointing out is so powerful. Because you're not telling him, oh, yes, you have lots of friends, but hey, isn't so-and-so and -and -and so-and-so still your friend? Yeah. Yeah. So how much has that changed? Not a lot. Okay. What has changed this? Yes. COVID has changed that for all of us. I miss those outside people, but that's, that's, that's a risk. I'm not, you know, everybody picks their poison. That's a risk I'm not willing to take right now. I'm not going to the grocery store, but I'll go sit with my inner circle on a patio. Right. (laughs) Their own poison and what they're choosing to, how they choose their risk of exposure right now in this culture. And, and I don't know what the vaccine's going to do to change that. I, it'll be interesting. This is going to air in April and there are even going to be more people vaccinated, you know? So, but, but yeah, our kids are dealing with a really interesting time of life. You know who I think has it the worst though? It's so interesting. I don't think anybody's really talking about this, but single people, I would never want it to be in 27 and single right now. I, I, and I feel for the single moms out there, you know, and dads out there that, are probably struggling. I mean, it's kind of funny. The research is showing there's a huge decrease of hookups, as you can imagine, during COVID, right? (laughs) It's funny. That's even in the adolescent world and the college world. There's less of that going on because of this pandemic. So it's kind of interesting. We probably have a higher quality of relationship, even though we have less relationship right now. But that less relationship, we were designed to have that. Uh And it feels strange. It does. And actually, I was just reading an article about the, it was like, it would probably be like the widest circle about how they miss talking to the UPS driver when he comes. Or um, I can't remember the other example that the author gave, but it was just these people who are totally on the periphery, but we like hanging out with them. Or maybe it's people you see at the gym all the time, then you're just not going to the gym and you're not friends. And it would be weird to say, Hey, let's, you know, let's meet up you know, outside or something like that. But even that level, we were designed to, you know, have those kinds of peripheral relationships and, and we miss them so much, you know, you know what else right I think, and, it, and we miss them in different levels. You may have some people who live in rural areas who are listening to this and they're kind of like, this is the world we live in all the time. But we, especially when we're looking at urban and suburban families, these are changes that we're navigating. Absolutely. But here's the other thing, and I want to talk about this too, because this affects mental health. And and when we look at love languages and the research that Gary Chapman's done, we look at physical touch. I mean, there are people I normally would hug who I am bumping elbows with, and it's getting old. And I think about that. So one thing I'm doing too as a parent is I'm hugging my kids more because like my son used to hug his best friend. Like, in fact, we had, they had a rule because his best friend's like a big hugger. And my son is not, does not like anyone to invade his bubble and then hold on to him for like 10 seconds. That is not something he enjoys as somebody with sensory issues and gets claustrophobic. So his best friend before COVID was only allowed one hug a day, like big, hugs. <laughs> they can have little hugs, but like they, they're so funny. They set the rules. This is what you get when you have a therapist son. Um, he's self-aware enough and then can ask for what he wants. So he's like one hug a day. And, um, but now they don't hug. So I want my son to have some extra hugs because of that. I tend to go by and like rub arms and shoulders more and stuff like that. And I think it's something I want to encourage parents to be aware of, especially if they're not touchers and they are Mm -hmm. raping somebody who needs to be touched that you may be you may be one of the only sources. So finding ways you're comfortable doing that right now might be really helpful to mental health too. I will tell you, I think that's the reason uh, you want to know one of the big explosions I know for certain is going to come out of this whole thing. What? Pets. Oh yeah, we've More seen that. People have gotten pets since they're at home, but also it's the, it's the contact, it's the interaction. It's something warm beside you. We're craving that a lot of us who are touchers and huggers. And so I think that's been a very, it's funny. People say that they will talk, we will talk about our grandkids. We'll talk about this season. Like we talk about our grandparents in the great depression or great parents, depending on your age, you know? Right. But yeah, that, that we will look at this the same way. This will be a time when our culture was different and severely impacted. And it'll be the pandemic of 2020 or in 2021 or something like that. And so with that, there have been cultural changes, which hopefully we're going to recover from. 
I don't think every, everything's ever going to go back to the way it is, was, and that's not all bad. I think there's good right. things that we can come from it too. But I think with our kids' mental health, we need to look at how they're thinking. We need to look at how they're feeling and we need to look at what they're doing. Those all contribute to the rise of depression, anxiety, um, ADHD, I think, especially you got to be careful. I, I don't want you to shut down your kids' screens. They are their modes of connection a lot of times to their peers. And they are also distraction is a great way to self-regulate. Sometimes if you're really anxious, games do among us will distract you. Well, you know, <laughs> I, I, you're laughing, but we all know what it is. Who's got a parent and kids in that age range, you uh-huh. know, um, but at the same time, I think we also need to help them find other interest and things they can do that may be different now, but that help them. And I'll tell you this, I'm grateful for teachers who are giving like really fun, creative science projects. Like one of my daughter's teachers got this thing where they're actually using lights, like LED lights in their boxes and stuff like that. And I'm grateful for that because that gets her off her screen. Now she did it with her friends. So they're on FaceTime together doing this together, but they're, and they're talking, showing each other their boxes. Hey, did you get that fuse to work? Yeah, I got my fuse to work. And I love all that. And those are creative ways that, you know, that's like picking up the phone and putting it in a speakerphone. Those of you who were talkers back in the 80s would recognize. Right. (laughs) So we still want to give our kids opportunities to have that kind of engagement. And they can do that without having somebody in your house with you. If it was a different era, that that boy probably would have come over and they'd have worked on it together. But that's not the way things are now. Right. Right. Okay. So what are, what are they thinking? What are they feeling? And what are they doing? I think that's a great. And not note. in a creepy stalker way. I, I don't think <laughs> I should have to say that. Um, but, you know, just taking moments, be curious, be a student, you know, be a study your child, um, ask them questions. But let me also say this, give your child, your ch- children are allowed to have some privacy, especially as they right. age. for adolescent kids. What they hide in darkness could grow, but you're not going to be able to control that anyway. So you pray that that would be exposed to the light, but then you Mm -hmm. allow them the freedom to learn the hard way, just like we all did sometimes. Right, right. Yeah, it's interesting when my son turned 17, I had this mental switch and I was, it just like all of a sudden I'm like, first of all, this is the last birthday he's going to be spending in my house, sniff. Uh, But it, that different approach and perspective as a parent of like, this kid's going to be launching and, you know, really pulling back a lot because it's, you know, I want him to have a successful launch and he's not going to do that if I'm holding on too tightly while he's home. Yes. I tell parents every year you should be loosening parameters unless your kids give you a really good reason that involves their safety not to because, and don't blow it up and make it into that, you know, too. You can do that, but don't justify it that way. But really and truly every, my mom said, that's, it's funny you said that. My mom said that was her biggest parenting mistake. I, you know, the therapist asked weird questions to their parents, like, (laughs) you can go back and do it again. What would you say was your biggest parenting mistake you do different? She said, it would be with you. You were the guinea pig. And I would have, we thought we'd just grab onto you, hold on tight and drop you off in college. And I, and you fought for your independence every step of the way. And you were a great kid. Like that was all unnecessary conflict between us and you and control with us that did not need to have occurred. And we would have had a better relationship with you in your twenties. We feel like if we had not done that. And, and so I remind myself of that sometimes when I want to say, Hey, you could take this project apart and it'd be so much easier. No, that's not my place. She knows that she's been told that. I taught her that when she was in fourth grade, that's up to her now to do, because I want her to make a bad grade and learn the hard way and get into that place when she has things go off in her world, she's able to cope with that. And that's really important too, that our kids are able to cope not only with their successes, but also their failures because we're all going to have them. Yes. And, and I know that in my mind, I know that it's really hard emotionally <laughs> when they have those failures, but at least I've, I've done enough learning that I'm like, okay, this is going to be good for him one day. Like this is really yeah. hard right, right now, but I know I mean, it's going to make if him you want some stronger. simple examples of that. If your child is in junior high or above, they should, unless they have a good reason, like you have a special needs child, who's a little age regress, they should be getting up with their own alarm clock. Whether you make them breakfast or not, because I like to give my kids the gift of some of these things sometimes, but they should be able to manage their own breakfast and their own morning routine without chaos. 
Mm -hmm. Those kind of things. Like we want to begin to let go of those things when they go to bed at night. I'm not regulating that as much with my 13 year old. Right. Because at some point now, if she's like starting to develop mental illness or she's starting to develop physical problems, I'm going to regulate that more. But ultimately I watch kids when I went off to college, whose parents like set their bedline bedtime, stay up all night because they could, because they didn't know any better. Like that's not healthy either. You've got to get them into the place of becoming president of like your child's name is John. He needs to become the CEO of John Inc. You cannot stay in that position when he's 15, 16, 17, he needs to at least be the vice president. So he's ready for the promotion. You know, oh, that's a great example. <laughs> that's a great analogy. Okay, Michelle, this I feel like we could go on and on and on. But I know you don't have you, know, you don't have time for that. So I won't keep you but I do have two more questions, which I've been asking all my guests. The first is, um, I'm so I'm fascinated by tattoos. I don't know why I don't have any but I just feel like people have really interesting stories. Uh, when they choose to have body art. So I'm wondering if you have any, if you did, would you be willing to share the meaning of one of them? And if you don't, if you had to get something, what would it be? And where would you put it? So the reason I don't, I do not have a tattoo. Okay. Because I am a person of continuous change and growth. And the tattoo that would fit me well at 18 would not fit me well at 50. So I kind of thought either if I get a tattoo, nothing has happened that I wanted just to stay with like that, because I kept thinking if I get a tattoo, I have to be satisfied with it or else I'm going to be covered in tattoos or else I've heard it's really painful to remove them. And I didn't want to go through that. I'm a big sissy. So there's no tattoo for me right now. See, I, I kind of like the idea and I've thought about getting the temporary tattoo with my word of the year on it. So I could like keep it for the word, you know, and I wouldn't even mind reapplying it because I love the idea. You know, the scripture talks about binding these things on our, our minds and our hearts. So I'm more of a post-it girl than a tattoo girl. Um, <laughs> but um, <laughs> I wonder if any of other guests have said that. Um, but I would, so my word of the year is productive because I love to consume information, um, time with people, everything else. But I know God has called me to produce things this, this year. So that's my word. I might put that there. But it's kind of funny because if I really narrowed it down and it would have to be a lifetime word, it might be loved. Oh, as goofy yeah. as that sounds, it might be loved because I believe that that love of God is what really secures me, inspires me, everything else. That's great. That's beautiful. I love that. And I love that you say that you're a person of change and growth and that's why you haven't. Maybe that's why I don't have one either because I've, I've always thought, well, do I want that? Do I want that when I'm 70? I don't know. So, <laughs> so I've never, I've never, yeah, never pulled the plug, but I think, or not pulled the plug isn't the right, pull the trigger. But um, I just think, I think I've had some really interesting conversations about with people. Okay. And then the second question is, do you have a meaningful Bible, Bible verse you would like to share with our community? Yeah, and I would probably pick the theme verse right now for Loved and Cherished, which is, I have loved you with an everlasting love. And I think the important part of that is everlasting. Um, and it's Jeremiah 31, 3, because it really gives you the idea that you're not going anywhere outside of God's love forever. And I think that if we can hold on to that, that always provides the cures to a lot of our mental health issues. It creates security. It creates hope. It creates peace in our lives. Um, so that's really important to me as a counselor. I think I told you, you know, it was hard for me to pick because like when I look at my profession, it's that idea of, um, freeing the captives, binding up the brokenhearted. That's so important to me, um, as a person. It's why, even though I feel very called and now am getting opportunities in this realm of speaking and writing, I don't want to give up the one-on-one -on -one face to face with this 15 year old girl who maybe has an eating disorder and the darkness is trying to swallow her. I want to free that captive and, and get to join God and experience God in that. It's amazing to me to get to do that. It's a huge privilege. And I'm grateful that I have chosen that as a career in it, even though it has a lot of hard things with it. It's been very fulfilling. I love that. And I can't help but point out that verse, I have loved you. There, there's your word, right? That you might do a temporary tattoo with, with, <laughs> with loved. Hey, Michelle, can you tell everybody how they can get a hold of you and where they can get loved and cherished? Yeah, I am kind of all over the place right now. So it's pretty easy to find me, but we have a website, lovedandcherished.me. You can find out more information about that. 
it is at every retailer you can imagine. Um, also, I'm on my own website is the easy version because neater is not easy to spell your mental health coach.com. And then okay. I have a podcast called Raising Brave Beauties, which is converting right now into raising mentally healthy kids. I'm, I'm going to try to really dig into those questions that the parents have, like, how do I find a good counselor? What does a good treatment plan look like? And all those things people want to know that it's going to be hard to answer because somebody's going to get mad at me when I say it, but I'm going to do it anyway, I think. So, yeah. <laughs> well, and I think that there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of need. There's a lot of curiosity surrounding mental health with our kids. And what I have found is my community really likes to learn this stuff. So that way they can know when it's time to take those steps. But I think um, there's a real thirst for understanding our mental health as well as um, our children's and how we can foster a, a you know, mentally healthy kids. Well, and I know I'm a counselor. It's going to sound like I'm trying to grow our business, which actually the whole reason I started writing and speaking was to shrink my business because I don't want as many kids to struggle with this. But I always say in, in doubt, if in doubt, check it out. I mean, the best check one parent ever wrote to me was in the first session. I said, uh, are you an extrovert? She's like, yeah. She said, I said, he's not depressed. He's a normal extrovert introvert. He's fine. He's got three main friends. He enjoys his life. He's His passions are very different than yours. They're all on the inside. You like to go on the outside, but he's just fine. She said, best check I've ever written. Thank you so much. Because I received, I I took the mom anxiety, I like to call it, like that mom anxiety off the plate for her. And she could kind of re, and, and I told her, now this is no guarantees. This is not, this is not have a right. lifetime guarantee. Remember, mental health is always a snapshot at that particular moment. But at that particular mm -hmm. moment, if he's telling me the truth, he's fine. He does not need to come back. That's great. That's great. Thank you so much for coming on. Absolutely. It was it's so much fun to talk with you, Amy. After Michelle and I finished this interview, we stuck around and chatted for a little bit because that's just what's something that's fun to do. And anyway, she said something that I wanted to pass on. She really encouraged me by saying, look, if we are out there listening and learning through podcasts and other mediums and reading the stuff online, we are probably doing a lot better than we think we are. Parenting is hard. And we don't always feel like we get it all right, or at least I don't. And that was just uh, such a beautiful covering of grace that I didn't even know that I needed. I have all of Michelle's contact information in the show notes, and I really encourage you to check out and purchase the Loved and Cherished devotional if you have young girls. I know that there's so much wonderful information in there. Don't forget to get your squat free strong legs program at gracedhealth.com slash strong legs. Of course, as always, that link is in the show notes. And also, this is always a little weird to ask. But if you find value in this show, would you bless me with a $5 virtual cup of coffee? There's a lot of back end costs associated with producing this podcast and the content on my website and socials. It's all free to you. But unfortunately, not to me. So any one time or monthly support you can give is greatly appreciated. You can go to buymeacoffee.com slash Amy Connell. I'll put that in the show notes. And if that's not in your budget, I get it. No problem. Simply sharing any episode to even one friend or your Facebook friends really helps the show leaving a review and be sure to follow the show, which was formerly subscribed. So you don't have to spend your time searching for new episodes. Okay. What's the one simple thing I want you to remember, which is something I try and pull out from all of my conversations because we go through a lot. <laughs> that is the importance of sleep on all of our mental health, not just our kids. I know it's not something that we can 100% control, especially in our teens as they are starting to self-regulate a little bit, but we can encourage it and we can educate them as best we can and model healthy sleeping in ourselves. And I will tell you, this is one behavior modeling I am happy to embrace. <laughs> like I said, I hit the sack pretty early, so it probably won't change very much, but I'm glad to know that I'm modeling something well. Okay, that is all for today. Go out there and have a great day.